Well, again, let me say Merry Christmas. Glad to have you tonight as we worship the coming of Christ. That moment when the infinite became an infant for you and for me. And we're naturally appropriately going to be looking at the birth narrative this evening. And we have a tradition in our home, uh, and maybe you have the same tradition where you read the birth story as a family. And, and I almost always read it from the Gospel of Luke. And, and we do that because the birth story of Jesus is actually given to us in two of our four Gospels, in Matthew and in Luke. And of the two, Luke gives more details than Matthew does. However, tonight we're going to be looking at it in the Gospel of Matthew. So let me invite your attention to Matthew chapter 1 tonight. And, and there are unique aspects of each narrative. Again, one is more detailed, the other more concise. But another difference of the two accounts is that the account of Luke uh, is really given more from the viewpoint of Mary, while the account in Matthew is given more from the viewpoint of Joseph. And so tonight is through the, through the lens, uh, through the eyes of Joseph that we're going to look at the birth of Jesus. So again, Matthew chapter 1 is where we're going to be uh, this evening. Matthew chapter 1, let's start in verse 18. Matthew wrote for us, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. So we know leading up to the birth of Christ, Matthew tells us of this really problematic circumstance into which Jesus would be born. Matthew tells us that, of course, there's Mary and there's Joseph. And Matthew says that they're betrothed, okay? And, and uh, in our culture, we kind of have a sense of what that means a little bit. What does it mean to be betrothed? We think of engagement, of course, and we know what that means pretty well. When a man and a woman express their intentions to be married someday. Someday in the near future, um, might be soon, it might be a little time off, but it's not that day, right? Like there's some other things we need to do. We need to, to plan, we got to find the venue, we got to find the photographer and the flowers and so on and so forth. Navigate COVID, uh, all of those things, you know, all those really fun but really stressful things about planning a wedding. But unfortunately, we know that, that sometimes, even with all those good intentions, and even with all of those plans, I mean, some couples just don't actually end up getting married. They decide to break things off. And we know that there's some real emotional implications if that happens, but really there's no real legal implications for that to happen. But betrothal in Jewish culture at this time meant something similar to engagement, but it, it carried a lot more weight with it. Betrothal was an engagement between this man and a woman. It usually lasted about a year or so, but it was viewed as much more than just two people or two families that have intentions of marriage. Legally, they were viewed as having such a commitment to one another that to break things off actually required legal action. There would be an actual divorce, actual papers of divorce, even though they're not married in the fullest sense of the word. And so Matthew here tells us that Mary is betrothed to Joseph, but in this period between betrothal and marriage, Mary's found to be pregnant. And we can imagine the scandal of that situation. This young, engaged girl is now pregnant. And while that's not an uncommon situation in our culture today, the law at that time actually demanded legal action. There were consequences for that. The woman would actually be publicly shamed, humiliated, viewed as an adulteress. And so here's Mary. But we know Mary wasn't an adulteress, right? Because Scripture tells us that this infant Jesus was conceived from the Holy Spirit. And that brings up all kinds of questions of how, why, how does that work? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight because here in a few months here at Grace Road on our Sunday morning sermon series, we're going to be doing a series through the Apostles' Creed. And one line of the Apostles' Creed is that Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And so here soon I'll, I'll explain 
why that's important, biblically, theologically, that Jesus was conceived of the Spirit. But, but it's with this background, this understanding of the scene in the context here, that we understand this description of Joseph that Matthew gives us. It says two things about Joseph. That Joseph was just. In other words, he faithfully followed the law. He wanted to follow it the right way. Do what it says. Be the just man he should be. And again, there were real consequences for Mary's condition and supposed acts that led to that. However, he was also unwilling to put her to shame. In other words, Joseph loved Mary. He had compassion on her. He didn't want her to face the humiliation that likely would have come her way. Instead, he said, I'm going to divorce you, but but I'm going to do it quietly. But look what happens as we continue. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. But as Joseph considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And so here's Joseph, he's making plans to divorce Mary, and an angel comes to him and explains the situation. The child, your fiancé, that Mary has in her womb is a son. And you're going to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this is the fulfillment of what was promised in the Old Testament. This specifically is from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Here in this passage, that a virgin will conceive. And they'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And again, his name will be Jesus. The Hebrew form of that name of Jesus is Joshua, Yeshua. It means God is salvation. The Lord is my salvation. And this is so vital to understand as we celebrate the birth of Christ at Christmas time. I mean, the angel declares to Joseph, the angel declares to us the purpose for the coming of Christ here. That he came to offer salvation from our sins. In other words, Jesus came to save his people from the most serious and grave threat to our lives, both now and for all eternity, our sins. Like understand that the salvation that we need most desperately is not to be saved in some national or political sense, or to be saved from a disease or pandemic, or to be saved from financial ruin and hardship, or to be saved from relational strife and tension. The greatest need that we have is to be saved from the just just punishment of our sin. And the good news of Christmas is, is Jesus came to do just that, to save us from our sin. That Jesus, by growing from infancy to adulthood, Jesus lived the perfect life you and I have not. That Jesus was arrested and put on trial and beaten and crucified for the very sins he came to save us from. And then by virtue of being the perfect sacrifice, he rose from the dead, uh, ascended to the right hand of the Father until he comes back to bring salvation fully. And the good news of the gospel is that now, by faith, in that finished work of Jesus, we can be saved from our sins. Again, everything the angel said to Joseph came true. So here's Joseph. Imagine him lying in bed. No doubt his mind flooded with worry and anxiety, probably a lot of disappointment. But the angel brings him the best news he could have ever heard. No, this child is the Savior. In fact, look at verse 21 again. He says, the angel to Joseph, She, Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, what's missing, uh, what's kind of missing our reading here is that in the original language there, when the angel says, for he will save his people from their sins, the pronoun he there. Uh, is in what's called the emphatic position. In other words, the word is placed in the sentence so that it's 
emphasized. In other words, it's as if the angel said, listen, Mary's going to bear a son and you're going to call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Now, why is that important? It's important because this passage comes on the heels of the entire first half of the Bible. The Old Testament tells the story of redemptive history, this history in which God makes many promises to his people, and all of those promises revolve around one big promise that he would bring salvation, that he would bring redemption, that he would make all things right that were lost in the fall. And this promise was made in a number of different ways to a number of different people over a period of several hundred years. And so for hundreds of years, the people of Israel are waiting in expectation. God's made a promise, and someday he's going to fulfill it. We don't know when, we don't know exactly how, but he's made this promise. So, so you can imagine sitting with your father and with your grandfather and, and them telling you, listen, this is what God's promised our people. Here's how he said he's going to take care of us. How he's going to bring salvation. And your grandfather saying, I learned this from my grandfather. And he learned it from his grandfather and so on and so forth. And then telling you, listen, we believe and we encourage you to believe too. God made a promise and he'll be faithful. And so Joseph would have had that experience hearing about the promise of God to bring salvation. Now, consider the words of the angel and the scene in which they're said. Here's Joseph, betrothed to Mary, yet he's decided to divorce her because of the child in her womb. He's ready to to dismiss this baby, and the angel stops him, and he says, Joseph, this is not just any infant. Like as precious as all children are, this infant is the one who is promised. In other words, this is the one you've been waiting for. This is the one we've all been waiting for. He is the Savior. He will save their people, his people from their sins. Don't turn away, Joseph. Don't neglect him. Don't dismiss him. Don't ignore him. Here in the womb of your fiance is the Savior of the world. And if you're a Christian this evening, I mean, these are words of good news to you as well. Right? Because at one point in your life, you realize You were longing for something more because your sin had had separated you from a holy God who you were created to know and to love and to enjoy. And you were longing for peace and longing for love and longing for hope and longing for peace. And you looked all over the place from it. You looked for it in your relationships, in your possessions, in your careers, in your own accomplishment, but you just couldn't find it there and you didn't know where to turn until you heard about Jesus and someone said, no, listen, he is the savior of the world. He's the one you've been looking for. He's the one you've been waiting for. And with joy, you you look to Christ and you turn from your sins and you fell on the grace of God offered through his only son, Jesus. And the truth is, is that if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you too have been waiting for something or someone, even if you didn't know it. And maybe you're familiar with the story of Jesus, maybe you're not at all, but either way, we would plead with you, just like the angel does to Joseph here in Matthew chapter one, don't turn away from this child. Don't dismiss him, don't neglect him, don't ignore him, don't reject him. He is the one whom your heart and soul has been longing for. He's the one who you've waited for, even if you didn't realize it. And by acknowledging your sin, believing in Jesus, and trusting in his work on the cross for you, you can be saved. It's your greatest need, and Jesus came to meet that need for you and me. I mean, this is what we celebrate at Christmas. This is why we celebrate at Christmas. The Savior has come. The one we were waiting for has come to us and offered us life. In fact, in our our passage in Matthew 1, there's a quote from Isaiah 7. We saw that there. But there's another verse in Isaiah that we should see tonight as we celebrate the first coming of Jesus, even though we still await his second coming. This is in Isaiah chapter 25. In this chapter, we we get this picture of what it's going to be like when Jesus comes again to bring salvation in the fullest sense of the word. And this is what he says in, in verse 9. It will be said on that day, Behold, This is our God. 
We've waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Even though we await that day, even tonight, we can be glad and rejoice in his salvation because he came the first time. Just like Joseph, just like Mary, just like the disciples, we rejoice because Jesus came to save us from our sins. This is what we celebrate. If you're not a follower of Jesus, know that God came to offer you salvation. Turn to him. He's the one you've been waiting for. Father, let's pray this evening. Let's pray. Father, we are just so thankful for your word. God, we're thankful, Father, for the opportunity tonight to get together to sing songs about you and your goodness and your grace. But Lord, we're just so thankful that you're a God of promises. Lord, that you make promises and you're faithful to keep them. That since the fall of man, you promised to make things right again. That you promised to bring an end to pain and death and mourning. That you promised to bring a salvation. And to do that, you sent your only son to be with us for a short time so that we could be with him forever. Father, thank you that Jesus came. Thank you that he humbled himself and took the form of a servant. Thank you that he laid down his life for us. Father, we pray, Lord, would you help us see the beauty and wonder again tonight, even though we might know the story very well. As we were reminded, he is the one we've waited for. And he came for us. Father, would you renew our hearts with hope and joy tonight as we dwell on that truth? And Father, again, if, if there's someone who has not seen their need for a Savior, who's not trusted in your Son, Lord, would you draw them to yourself tonight and give them faith? Father, we love you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Cody told us the first part of the story from Matthew chapter 1, uh, the birth narrative of Christ, and then I'm going to tell the second part in Matthew chapter 2, um, where it's the story of the imposter. So he had the, the bright narrative, and I have the dark one, which is actually very fitting for our personalities. And... Um, <laughs> And we'll start in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of, Ju of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Now just to give you a little background on Herod, um, there, there are a couple different Herods in the book of Matthew. This one is the first one. He's known as Herod the Great. Uh, he died very early in the life of Christ when Jesus was a toddler. And, and Matthew calls him the king here. Uh, but his rule was not over the entire Roman Empire. He was what was called a client king under Rome. He was appointed to be the king of a state of, of Israel, not the whole country. And, and just like the tax collectors, he was hated because he extended Roman rule over the Jewish people who were supposed to be free. And deep within their psyche was embedded the belief that they were supposed to be a free people under God. They were supposed to be able to live a life that wasn't controlled by a bunch of outside rulers, but only controlled by the laws of their God. And so for that reason alone, they resented King Herod. They resented him just for existing at all because he was extending that unjust rule. As people, we don't tend to do really well under authority that we don't think should be there. My, uh, my freshman year of Bible college, I went to a pretty strict Bible college, and it was kind of legalistic. There were an awful lot of rules. And on my floor, we had an RA, and the RA was the guy who was like a, a year ahead of us in school um, who would kind of babysit everybody on the floor. And, and he was the guy who was just thrilled with the fact that he had some authority. And he used to barge into our rooms without knocking because he had a key. We would come back into our rooms sometimes after being gone and he'd rifled through all of our stuff just to make sure we didn't have any contraband, which in those days included non-Christian CDs and non-King James versions of the Bible. And so, so he was looking for all of our violations. Um, I went there after a year of college somewhere else. So, so he was a year younger than me. Um, his parents were, were paying all of his bills. I was out on my own. And so it was difficult to look at that guy as any kind of legitimate authority. And so, so I really can't in church go into all the details about all the pranks that ended up being played against that guy. But just the natural resentment against authority that shouldn't be there came out regularly. And so, so here's Herod trying to extend unjust authority. He's ruling over people who don't think he should be there, and there was resentment. There were frequent uprisings, there were attempts to overthrow Herod's power left and right, which fed into his increasing paranoia. He was suspicious of everybody around him, including many people in his own family. He also used to think that everybody was out to get his wife, so he used to have family members, including an uncle, killed to protect his marriage. And he fought even harder to protect his reign. 
He had people executed left and right to make sure that there was no competition for his throne. So Herod the king held on to his power by executing the enemy and using terror to keep his people submitted. He was big on big, bloody public executions to make sure that everybody knew that you don't mess with King Herod. So this guy ruled with fear. On top of that, he ruled with lies. He called himself the king of the Jews, but he wasn't the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. His genealogy didn't line up with what it was supposed to be, so he actually circulated false genealogies, making it look like his rule was legitimate, but the Jewish leaders saw right through it. They knew that he wasn't legit, and so they resented him even more for for lying to them. And then on top of that, he would rule with manipulation. He knew that the Jews were upset over the fact that they didn't have a temple anymore. Solomon's great temple had been destroyed, and it was a big part of their national identity. So Herod, to try to get on their, their good side, came along and built a temple for them to worship in. And he got a bunch of Jewish leaders to be loyal to him with money and with bribes in hope that he would sway popular opinion into his favor. So we have a contrast. Already we have the true king of the Jews in Jesus born in Bethlehem, while the false king of the Jews is ruling with fear and lies and manipulation. And so picking up the story again, verse 1, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So these wise men, we don't know how many, they they see the star that appears at the birth of Jesus and they come and travel to worship the king of the Jews. The first place they go is to Herod in the palace because they think that the only place that a newborn king would be would be in a palace in the most powerful city in the region in Jerusalem. So they go to Herod and ask, where's the new king? We know that he's born. We we know this is happening. The star told us that there's a new king of the Jews that's here. So where is he? And so you can imagine how that would, would fly with Herod, who's paranoid, He's crazy, he's power hungry and insecure and all of a sudden people come guided by a star saying, where's the new king? Well, I'm the king. What do you mean a new king of the Jews has been born? We don't need a new king. We got the old one. He's doing just fine. I'm the guy. So he calls his prophets together and he asks them, guys, according to the Bible, uh, where is the Messiah? Where is the anointed king supposed to be born? And they say in Bethlehem, which would have totally surprised the Magi. Kings are supposed to come from prominent cities. But this king is going to come from from the tiny little rural town of Bethlehem. That's where royalty is going to come from. So the, the Magi are pretty surprised, but Herod is just ticked at this whole thing. And even hearing that a new king would be born in Bethlehem would, would certainly upset him because Herod had a summer palace in Bethlehem. And he would go there to relax and recharge so he could get refreshed and come back and do a better job at being a murderous dictator. And so so that was the place that he would go to rest. And everybody knows you don't interrupt a dictator's vacation. And this is why Dr. Leo Marvin flipped out in What About Bob? Which is, I think, a favorite movie for every pastor because, because Bill Murray showed up at his vacation home for counseling. You don't interrupt vacation. You don't do that. And here God chooses that in the vacation home of this tyrant would be born the true king. And God's not overly concerned with Herod the Great's vacation arrangements, and he has Jesus, this big threat to Herod's power, born right in his favorite vacation spot. And so Herod doesn't kill the wise men for saying there's a new king. He doesn't kill the prophets for saying there'll be a new king born in Bethlehem. He attempts to manipulate them all into finding this new king so that he can quote-unquote worship him. Verse 9 says, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. 
And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So Herod's claim that he wanted, his, wanted to worship, it, it looked authentic to them and it seemed believable to the Magi. So they follow the star to the place where Jesus is and they expect to come back and tell Herod uh, where, where Jesus is born. So they go and they, they see Jesus and upon seeing him, they realize this is the one. This is the one we've been waiting for. They'd just been in the palace and they saw the powerful paranoid king in a palace, but the star red, led them to this rural hick town called Bethlehem and that's where the true king was. And they find him and they worship. They offer their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh and then they head home because God warned them that Herod wasn't being genuine. And so in these stories, we see two kings, two powerful people. Both are showing their power, but the power of the kingdoms of this world and the power in the kingdom of God, those are two very different powers. King Herod ruled by striking fear in the hearts of his people. But Jesus ruled by coming to empty himself of all of his power. By being born in a questionable family line under questionable circumstances, but bringing peace. King Herod ruled by oppressing people, but Jesus came to free them. King Herod ruled with lies, but Jesus came as the truth. King Herod ruled by trying to control and manipulate, and Jesus came and ruled with joy. And so the question for us today is, do our lives bear the marks of being ruled by a king who frees? The true one that we've been waiting for? Or do our lives bear the marks of being ruled by a king who rules us with fear? Who rules our lives? Because as much as we're here to worship Jesus as our king, we can so often live like something else or someone else is in charge. There can be something else driving us, something else reigning over us, and we might have something else ruling us to the point where, where we notice it because we are weighed down all the time with fear. This is how Herod ruled, and so often this is the way some of our false gods rule us. They rule us with fear, and, and our fears can reveal to us who our true king is. So it's worth questioning our, questioning our fears. It's worth asking ourselves, who do my fears tell me about who or what is most important to me? Does it reveal, do my fears reveal that I've fallen under the sway of some other king? So what are you afraid of? Like, ask yourself the question, how would you answer, how would you fill in this blank if this blank thing happened, I just couldn't go on? Or I don't know if I could keep my faith if this thing ever happened. Or I must have this to have peace. Otherwise, I'll always be fearful. Or I would never have peace if I lost this. What do you fear? Is that the loss of friends, the loss of status symbols, the loss of a job, the loss of money, the loss of people's high opinion of you? What could you lose that would be so devastating that you wouldn't even know who you are anymore? Because those fears can reveal that you're being driven by an imposter king, by a different God. Not a good God who comes to give and to save, but one who makes you always afraid. Our fears can also reveal to us that we're believing lies. We're afraid because I, I believe the lie that God won't always be with me. I'm afraid because I believe the lie that God isn't truly good. I'm afraid because I believe the lie that if I lost that thing, God would not be enough for me. If my life ends up in this one place that I fear it could end up, then God wouldn't be enough there. I'm afraid because I believe the lie that death is the end. I'm afraid because I believe the lie that I have to fix every problem and make every circumstance right, believing the lie that I'm the sovereign God of my universe. And our fears can then make us manipulatable. We're sold fears to get us to act all the time. Everybody does this. 
All of our advertising does this. We're always being told that we have to act in a certain way, otherwise this feared outcome will come. We might even look at our relationships this way and we might say, if I don't marry this person, then I'll always be lonely. There will be no hope for me. There will be no future for me. And so driven by our fears, we make our decisions. Or we get manipulated by people looking for political power. We're sold to fear. Christians, you're about to lose your culture. You're about to lose your world. You're going to lose your true joys unless you vote for me, and then I'll get in there and I'll kick some tail and and things will be okay for you. And we believe it because we're afraid. And then we make a lot of our decisions not as acts of faith where we say I'm doing this because I trust God is leading me to do something to accomplish a good purpose or as acts of love where I say that what's the best thing that I can do to serve my neighbor, but instead we're so afraid of what could happen if we don't act in a certain way that we make big life-altering decisions based on fear. And so we have this reign of terror in our lives. And it's not altogether different from Herod's. And when we're driven by fear, Jesus is not our king. And so the call tonight is the same call as every Christmas. Let earth receive her king. We're all going to serve somebody. We're all going to be reigned over by somebody. We'll either be reigned over by the Herods in our lives that take or by the Jesus who gives. And so if tonight you realize that Jesus has not been your king, if tonight you're saying, I don't know him, coming to him is simple. I mean, it starts with admitting that you need him. Admitting that you've sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Admitting that you're cut off from God because of your sin and that ache in your heart is an ache for God. But then the way that you receive him as king is not by your doing, it's not by your religion, it's just by trust. By believing that Jesus Christ came to save. That he went to the cross to pay for your sin and he died there, absorbing the wrath that you deserved. He was buried and he rose again. And if you believe that, you can can turn to him and trust in him and repent. Turn from the other kings, the other things that were driving you, the other things that you trusted to make you okay, and make Jesus that thing. And if in faith you'll turn to him and receive him, he'll come in and forgive you. He'll come in and rule and reign. And Christians, as we start to see all of the the signs of the reigns of other kings in our lives, as fear creeps up, as we believe lies, as we see that we're being manipulated, we can confess and turn from those things now and be free. Jesus really did come to bring joy to the world, and that joy is available for everyone who will trust in him. So let's pray and confess our sins to him, knowing that he takes them as far from us as the east is from the west, and then let's continue to worship. Well, Father, we become so easily fearful when it seems that life is out of control. We fear those who have the power to take from us, to embarrass us, to disapprove of us, to thwart our dreams and our desires. We don't remember that you're a king who comes to bring peace and who also governs every molecule in this universe, including every thought and word and deed that occurs. So as a result, we act as if our futures lay entirely within our own grasp or that they're at the disposal of those around us. So forgive us for our faithless fear. Jesus, thank you for your humble and constant trust in your Father. Thank you that you feared no one on earth, but instead you feared the Lord with perfect reverence. When evil people did their worst to you and nailed you to a cross and killed your body, you still entrusted your soul to your Father's hands. You entered that suffering for our sins so that we would never have to fear the worst. So thank you that your perpetual confident faith is now counted to us as if it were our own. In response to that, Holy Spirit, I pray that you give us a fresh boldness to face each day, a boldness that flows from believing in God's promises and knowing you were faithful and knowing that you came to save. Remind us of that truth and help us to live like you're real. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.